Hello everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. Today we have a rubber key 48k spectrum that's come in with a suspected upper RAM fault. It's a low-ish serial, so I'm expecting to see an issue 2 in here. Uh, the reason the upper RAM is suspected is because the machine boots, it loads 16k games but won't load 48k games, and that's fairly typical of a problem with the upper RAM. Now I think this has been in for a service at some point, the keyboard membrane is kind of reinforced and fingers crossed it's going to work because it's a pig to get the faceplate off the issue 2s because they're glued on. So here it is, it is an issue 2, it has a fairly early ULA which is appropriate for an issue 2. These can be a bit hard of hearing so I hope the owner has a powerful cassette player to load his games from. There's our transistor patch, and you can see that the ROM is socketed, which um, also leads me to believe it's been in for a service at some point. We're going to manually diagnose the RAM fault here before bringing in the diagnostic interface. So first things first, I'm going to perform a composite video mod so we can see what's happening while we do the test. While that's happening, as is tradition, let's have question one of the three questions I give to the owner of the machines I receive. Question one is, what was your first Spectrum experience? And the answer is... Unofficially, opening his first Spectrum on Christmas Day in 1985, but being honest he knew where his parents had hid it prior to Christmas and he used it on numerous occasions prior to the big day, and loved it. Cast your minds back to the first video ever posted on this channel all the way back in April 2020. We had an issue 6A with multiple faults, one of which was the upper RAM fault. In this case I think there was only one broken chip, uh, but we're going to use the same philosophy to test this machine. So, let's take the upper RAM 8 chips, number them 1 to 8 as you can see here. We'll line them up in order from right to left. The test is very simple, we expect memory to remember data and each of these chips has the ability to remember one bit of data in each address. So we're going to write data to the chips and read it back and see if it remembers it correctly. It almost seems too simple doesn't it? So let's start by writing 85 to an address in upper memory. 85 in binary is alternating zeros and ones and we'll read it back using a peak command, and the answer we get from this machine is 87, which means the second chip gave back the wrong value. So let's flip the bits, we're going to write 170 to the same address, which is alternating ones and zeros the other way, and we're going to read back and get 175, which implies that the first and third chips were given the wrong data. And just to show it dead clear, let's try writing 0 to that same address, which should be all zeros in binary. The answer we get was 7 again implying that the chips numbered 1, 2 and 3 always stuck high. Simple, and if you don't believe me, here's a quick shot of doing that last test. I'm using address 50,000 which resides somewhere in upper memory, writing the value 0, and then print peak to get the value from it and print it on the screen, and getting the value 7. Now just to be sure, we're going to run a diagnostic ROM, because these are a bit more clever and do a few more tests than we can do manually. Here we can see the lower RAM passes, upper arm gives us a fault at those same three memory chips. I think we can be fairly confident now that we've got three bad memory chips that need replacing. This feels like a good opportunity for question two, and question two is what was or is your favourite Spectrum game? The answer was Great Escape, so let's watch that in the corner while these chips are replaced. The method I'm using here is to cut the legs of the chips close up to the body of the chips, and I'm only doing this because I'm quite sure that these chips are useless now. Once the bodies are out, you need to remove each of the pins by heating the joint and removing the pin. Now, although this is supposed to be a quick and easy way to remove chips, at this point you are actually pulling on one trace alone, so you really need to be careful to heat the entire joint and remove it with very little force, otherwise you'll pull a track quite easily. Once those legs are out, it's time to clear the joints of solder I always find this a bit trickier when there's no legs sticking out to kind of brace the solder sucker against, so just be careful. There we are, that's looking lovely. Now it's time to find three sockets to go in. It's generally advised to use sockets when replacing chips just for future convenience, but it's really up to you. 
If I didn't have a socket and I was replacing one chip and I was certain that was the problem and I was certain I was putting in a good chip, I wouldn't have a problem not using a socket if I wanted to get the job off quickly. If you are using sockets, you want them to be neat and flush to the board, so just solder in opposing corners, so one pin at one end and one pin at the other end on the opposite side, and then what you can do, as you can see here, is apply force to the socket while heating each of those opposite pins to make sure they're flush. Just be careful not to burn your finger on the pin that you're heating. Now it's just time to solder up the rest of the legs. Now there are a lot of things to consider when soldering, this is fairly basic soldering skills and lots of videos online to help you with that. We just need to put in the replacement chips now and we should be away. These chips are Korean, I haven't seen ones like this before, but the package they came in suggested they were bought from Retroleum so I trust them. One last blast with a diagnostic ROM shows that everything is in order with lower and upper memory now. So all we need to do is do a refurbishment job on the machine, some final testing and it's good to go. As normal we'll replace the capacitors. I do recommend that you only replace one or two at a time and power up in between each one. Um, I'm trying to work quite quickly here so I did them all at once. You'll notice that I fitted the capacitors near the heatsink as far away as possible from the heatsink just because I don't want them to get too hot. Also, one of the capacitors on an Issue 2 board is incorrectly marked up polarity-wise on the PCB, so be careful with the polarity as you're fitting them. Last jobs were to fit the heatsink to the ULA, which meant desocketing it, clean the edge connector, and put it all back together. And that leaves us with the final question, question three, what are the plans for this machine in particular? And this machine is going to the owner's five-year-old daughter. I'm looking forward to hearing how she gets on with it. Thanks everyone for watching, stay tuned for more videos.